taking great steps uh, to make all of our lives better uh, through natural resource conservation. And to wrap up, you will be blessed beyond belief by getting the opportunity to hear a few closing remarks from me. So please sit back and enjoy yourselves. I'd like to take just a, minute, just a minute or so to introduce uh, my staff and, and board of directors. Uh, Charles Preston is our assistant manager. For those of you that are here, please, please stand for just a few minutes while I make these introductions. Danielle Madden is our office manager. Kyle Ann Hopkins, our data and outreach coordinator. Todd Phillippe, our resource conservation coordinator. Craig Urick, water resources coordinator. Lydia Hendrickson, GIS. Lynn O'Kiffey, Keely Williamson, Jody Fiscus, <coughs> Dave Christian, Ethan Worley, and Seth Pop, all natural resource water technicians. Paula Kilfow, data analyst, Amanda Shepard, community forest, our community educator, Katie Bowers, the Western Assistant Community Forester, Kirsty Moore, our special project coordinator, Ken Ridgeway, resource conservation tech. Renee Smith, she's back at the office, keep the pitch running back there. She's our secretary and accounts payable clerk. And uh, Susie Kaufman is our receptionist and accounts receivable clerk. Becky Sheenland is our field clerk for Scott's Bluff and Bridgeport. And Jerry Allworth, our field clerk in Oshkosh. As for our board of directors, Roger Eyrick is our chairman. Ken Van Dress, our vice chairman. Pete Lapisota, secretary. Brian Ritter, treasurer. Mark Westfall. Lane Darnell, Dave Dennis, Chuck Hinkle, and Dan Weinrace are all directors uh, for the North Platte Natural Resource District. Please help me recognize these individuals for all the hard work and effort they provide to protect their natural resources. So a few housekeeping items before we kick off. Uh, in your agenda folder, you'll find a, uh, instruction sheet on how to ask questions uh, anonymously. So if there's something that you want to ask and don't want to come to the mic, uh, there is a process for that. Uh, uh, you can uh, do that through uh, your, your phone, or uh, if you want to just raise your hand if you have a question and uh, write on a piece of paper, we can certainly get that up here and uh, get to Brian. Uh, also in your, your folder, you'll find a yellow uh, sheet that's for feedback for uh, the symposium today. If you don't mind please filling that out, I appreciate that, uh, uh, so that we know if uh, you, you all have uh, uh, enjoyed your time to spend here today. Uh, you'll, there's several other papers in there about general information about the NRD. And then there is a quiz, or a test your knowledge uh, uh, piece of paper in there that is a quiz. So if you're listening good today, uh, you'll uh, be able to answer those couple questions that are on that quiz. And at the, uh, uh, I think it's at 12.15, uh, we'll be turning those in to uh, the staff here, and we'll grade your answers, and the 10 lucky uh, winners uh, will get a $300 Visa gift card um, from uh, proceeds that have come from our sponsors. I'd like to take just a second just to recognize the sponsors that helped us put this on today. Symmetrics. NRCS, Dan Coleman Company, Platte Valley Bank, Farm Credit Services of America, Lobster Camp Feedlot, Farmers Irrigation District, McCrominer, Trans West Ford, Inglehoff Agency, Item Irrigation, Inland Truck Parts, Kelly Bean, Darnell Ranch, uh, Trans West Ford. Those are our sponsors today. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Brian Heffy is a farmer and agronomist from Baltic, South Dakota. For over 25 years, he and his brother Darren have co-hosted IPHD TV, the nation's most watched agronomy television show. The brothers also host the most listened to ag radio program in the US, IPHD Radio. Brian is an author, Father of three, a Christian, and a long suffering Minnesota Vikings fan. So please help me welcome Brian. All right, good morning. Who likes regulations? 
Yep. When you look at uh, what's going on here in your area, that's why Scott asked me to come over and visit with you a little bit, uh, about regulations. So it's a super fun topic, right? Uh, but here's the number one thing that I want to start the day with, and please write this down if you don't know this, this fact. What's the drinking water standard for nitrate nitrogen in water in the United States? What's the drinking water standard? What's the limit on how much nitrate you can have before it becomes dangerous versus, okay, we're at a level where it's safe? What's the number? Yeah. 10 parts per million. That is the most important thing to know. 10 parts per million is the drinking water standard for nitrate nitrogen. The reason why I bring this up, my dad talks to me about this all the time growing up on the farm. He constantly say, the dose makes the poison, okay? Anything can kill you. I'll show you later about even water, just flat out water with no nitrate. At a level, everything can kill you. So we're always looking at, we gotta keep the levels down so it's safe for everyone. Um, so this is probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, my brother Darren and I were in Denmark and we were talking to some farmers over there and looking at their great wheat yields. I mean, some of these guys are getting 130, 140 bushel wheat. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is tremendous. What are you guys doing? We go through stuff. And then toward the end, one of the guys goes, well, yeah, but we're still mad. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, here in Denmark, we're regulated on how much nitrogen we can apply. And so all our friends right across the border in Germany, they're all beating us. We don't like it when the Germans beat us. And anyway, we went to one guy's farm, and he goes, yeah, the regulations are terrible here. I can't turn a wheel in the spring until I turn in this great big government report. I'm like, what? I, I, I said, can you show me the report? So he gave me a copy. 25 pages he had to fill out, and he was only a 400-acre farmer. 400 acre farmer had 25 pages of government paperwork he had to fill out before he could turn a wheel. So anyway, hopefully we can prevent those kind of things from happening here in the United States, but that's what some of the people in, in different foreign countries are dealing with. All right, so today's topics. Uh, we'll talk about how much nitrogen soils can hold. Uh, how can you use nitrogen without leaching away? Our natural products, like the, the nitrogen replacement biologicals, are they worth the money? Uh, what are keys to yield besides nitrogen? Uh, what are the most important factors you should be looking for in soil? Yes. Do I need to pay attention to micronutrient levels on my crops? How do I control weeds, insects, nematodes, and diseases in corn, dry beans, and alfalfa? How dangerous are pesticides to humans and the environment? And how can I speak to non-farmers about all the great things we're doing today and today? So, we're going to talk a little about nitrate. Uh, we got a little break for you. Uh, this morning, Scott said five minute break. I know how these things work. It's not going to be a five minute break. Probably be just a hair more than that. But anyway, uh, we got lunch uh, a little after 11, and you can see uh, just some of the things we're talking about. And all day, we're going to have fun. Now, if you told your buddies, yep, I'm going to this symposium, and we're going to talk about nitrates and regulations and soil testing, they probably thought, oh my gosh, what are you doing? That sounds terribly boring, right? But a couple of things. First of all, we can talk a lot about the environment, and we will. But think about this. If nitrate ends up in the water, it didn't end up in your crop, which means lost money for you. Now on the farm, I like working and I like raising a crop and everything else, but you know what I like even more than that? Making money. So we're going to talk today about making a little bit more money, hopefully, on the farm. And here's the other thing I want you to think about. I got a little story for you. So in 2007, I was over in Israel, and I was on a guy's farm two miles away from the Gaza Strip. And we're outside talking a little bit, and a farmer at one point goes, hey, Brian, you see those flags up there? And I go, yeah, what, what, what's on? He goes, yeah, see the flag up on top, how it's kind of tattered? I go, yeah. What about it? He said, yeah, that's where a missile hit it. I go, what? He said, yeah, there's some crazy person from Gaza area. It shot a missile over my farm. I got it on video. Went through my flag there, and it blew up my workers' barracks, 
right away. I'm like, oh my gosh, did people get killed? He goes, no, no, it was, it was the middle of the day. Everybody's out in the field. But then he starts kind of joking about it, and he goes, well, there, I guess there was one guy that called in sick, and he's fine and everything else, but he, you know what? Ever since then, uh, it, I, I, I think maybe this is one of the best things that happened to my farm, because ever since that happened, I haven't had a single guy call in sick. <laughs> so anyway, if you turn on the news anymore, you're probably going to see something about Israel. It's this tiny little country, compared to the size of the state I'm from, South Dakota, it's one-seventh the size of the state of South Dakota. It's just a little country. But look at what you have around. You got Egypt, you got uh, Syria, you got Lebanon, all these countries that literally want to blow them off the face of the earth. Also, the Gaza Strip, it's this tiny little area right here. It's only the, it's the size and area of Las Vegas with about three times as many people as Las Vegas. Okay, just think about that. But anyway, I'm talking to this farmer about, well, what do you do with, I mean, somebody shooting a missile at you? And he goes, Brian, let me tell you a couple things about Israel. First of all, everybody in the country has to serve in the military. Men serve three years, women serve two, everybody. And everybody in the country is in the reserve till age 40. We've grown up with this. We know all about terrorists, military training, everything else. And by the way, like almost any group, so this was, at, I was at a tourist site, and there's this group of Israeli women, and sure enough, they're accompanied by an armed guard. They have guards out in front of almost every building, closed circuit cameras everywhere. And as you hear all this, you're probably like, oh my gosh, what the world are you doing doing Israel? Well, I did a little homework before I went there. Do you know that their murder rate is actually half of our murder rate? And their life expectancy is actually two years longer. When they have, I mean, you've heard about some of these random shootings in the United States. Generally speaking, they shut it down just like that. Because keep in mind, again, everybody's been very well military trained. In fact, uh, when I came back, the first time I was over in Israel, um, I was giving a little talk about it, and a, a guy who had served in the military came up after that, and he goes, hey, Brian, I just want to tell you what you're saying about the Israelis. Oh, yeah, we think here in the U.S. we're very well trained. We are compared to everybody else in the world except for the Israelis. He said one of those people is like three of us. They're unbelievable. But anyway, so I'm talking to this farmer about, you know, what do you, what do, you do with this whole thing getting shot at by a missile? And he goes, look, Brian, here's generally the way it works. Our special ops, they're like nobody else's in the world. What they're going to do is when something like that happens, they just slip into Gaza, nobody knows they're even there, and they find whoever that person was, and all of a sudden, that person just disappears. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm telling you this story because I just want to go back to, we're going to have some fun today. I want you to think about all the other places you could be in the world. Okay, when was the last time you had a missile shot at your farm? Seriously. And by the way, let me just ask a quick show of hands. How many of you have ever been to a third world country? Have you ever been to a third world country? Only a few of you. For the rest of you, please go to a third world country sometime. I mean, there's a good chance you'll make it home. <laughs> but I'm dead serious. Go to a third world country for once. I've been to many third world countries. And when you are there, well, first of all, you're going to go, oh my gosh, please get me home as fast as I can. But you're going to say, wow. I didn't realize people had it this bad. And so I was over in India uh, about five years ago now. I was talking to a guy for a while, and he goes, I, I, I always like asking people in these foreign countries, what do you think about you know, stuff in the United States and US people and everything else? And anyway, the guy stopped me at one point, he goes, right, just don't ever forget. America, that's the dream. For us and farmers all over the world, we would kill to have the opportunity you do in your country. So please, don't ever forget that. And as we start this day today, and you're thinking, oh, regulations, and oh, I gotta learn something about soils, and oh my gosh, I slept through that in college. No, be thankful that you have the opportunity that you do to live and work and farm in the greatest country in the world. So please, go into it that way, rather than thinking the other way. And if you start thinking the other way, like, oh, this is boring, whatever, go to a third world country sometime. You'll be happy to get back here. Okay, so, soils. I had Scott send me uh, a couple of soils tests, 
And I just want to ask you one quick question when you see that up on the screen, and I think I got that in your hand out there, right on page one. Just out of curiosity, how many in the room can look at that soil test and you say, okay, I know exactly what's going on with that soil, how heavy the ground is, what I need to do for fertility, what I need to do to raise top yields. How many can read that soil test very well? Just raise your hand if you can. And look around the room at how few hands are up. Okay, so for almost all of us, we're farmers, we spend lots of money on fertility, this should be one of the most important things to know. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this as we go through the day to day. The first thing and where we're gonna start is this, cation exchange capacity. So for our talk on nitrates, it really starts here. What cation exchange capacity is, that is the holding capacity of your soil, your soil's ability to hold everything, okay? And what it is, it's a measurement of the type of clay, the amount of clay, and the amount of organic matter that's in your soil. Now obviously the organic matter, that's the only one you can change, okay? So, if that soil has a cation exchange capacity more than 20, we consider that a heavy soil. If it's less than 10, we call that a light soil. Plus than five, we're gonna call that sandy, almost certainly low organic matter soil. So the reason why we like having that number, because in the past you probably go, oh, I just I know I have heavy soil, what difference does it make if I have this number to it? Well, we want to know how heavy and how light that soil is. Okay? And here's one of the things we use it for. We take cation exchange capacity times 10. That will give you a rough idea on how much nitrogen your soil can hold at any one time, at least in the short term. It's not going to hold it forever, but at least it gets you kind of in the general ballpark. Okay? So we're going to talk about that a little bit as we go throughout the day, talking about nitrogen. Organic matter. Like I said, that's a big component of that. So why is organic matter important? And all these things, you can read through all that stuff, but the two things that I wanted to focus on are the two right at the bottom. Organic matter can hold approximately three times as many nutrients as clay, and organic matter can hold the anions, the things that can leach, like nitrogen, better than clay. So, here's one of the other things that you may never have heard before, but this is unbelievably important. Through mineralization, Every single year, each 1% of organic matter in the soil releases approximately 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen, 4 to 7 pounds of phosphate, 2 to 3 pounds of sulfur. Uh, the potassium, by the way, the reason why it doesn't release potassium, potassium is pretty much all flushed out prior to it, it, any residue becoming organic matter in the soil. Nutrient release will usually be greater in warmer years, and for every 1% of organic matter increase in the soil, the soil can hold approximately 4% more water, okay? So, I wanna go back to this at the top here. Have you heard of this before? For every 1% of organic matter in your soil, your soil is gonna release roughly 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen every single year for free. So, a lot of times, what I hear from legislators and you know people talking and they don't know agriculture, they go, well, just stop putting nitrogen on and then we're not gonna have any issue with nitrate in the groundwater. Oh no, it actually could make it worse. So there's a farmer we do a lot of work with over in the state of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota had come to him and they said, hey, we wanna work with you because we think a lot of farmers are way over applying nitrogen and you've got some pile of ground and it's in uh, pieces here, little chunks, so we can separate these things out. Here's what we want to do. We want to put on double the nitrogen, we want to put on normal nitrogen, and we want to put on no nitrogen, and you go raise your crop, and let's just see, let's test the water afterwards. Where do you think they had the most nitrogen coming out? Where they put on no nitrogen on the soil? Because they did raise a good crop, and they needed that crop to suck the nitrogen out that was being created by that soil all the time. So the answer is not raising no crop. The answer is not putting no nitrogen on. So that is one of the most important things that I want to stress to you today. We can't solve this problem by not using nitrogen. In fact, we'll probably make it worse. So let's talk about this real quick. Here are a couple examples. One and a half percent organic matter soil versus seven percent organic matter soil. So that one and a half percent organic matter soil uh, 
every single year will create about 30 to 45 pounds of nitrogen, 6 to 11 of phosphate, 3 to 5 of sulfur. The 7% organic matter soil will create roughly 140 to 210 pounds of nitrogen, 28 to 49 of phosphate, 14 to 21 of sulfur. Plus, it will have approximately 22% more water holding capacity versus the 1.5% organic matter soil. So, I just want to ask you this question. And to do this, I'm going to ask, Ed, I know this is going to be a stretch, but can you please stand up for me just a second? I, you can do it, well, at least most everybody can. Stand up for me, yeah, just stand up right now. I'm going to answer this question, and you can sit down when I arrive at your answer. Okay, so here's my question for you. All right, how many people tomorrow, these two pieces of ground, one that has 1.5%, one that has 7 they're coming up for auction, and you have enough money to buy one of them. Which one are you buying? Whoever wants to buy the 1.5% organic matter ground, you can sit down right now. Okay, you're buying the 1.5% organic matter ground. Now look around the room, and look at how many said they're going to buy 7%. Okay, you can have a seat. And here's what I want you to think about. Okay, all of you just said you're going to buy that 7% organic matter ground. I don't think you are, you know why? Because before you buy the ground, you don't get a soil test. And even if you did, had you ever heard of these facts right here before? We, I, I want you to think about this for just a second. Let's say that there was a business coming up for sale here in town or in your local town. Okay? It's close to home. It looks nice. You've driven past it for years. It connects right up to another business you own. But you don't look at the books and you just say, well, whatever it's going for, i got to buy it. Okay? Would anybody say that's a smart way to buy a business? Of course not. They'd go, what are you doing? You've got to do your due diligence and look at the books and everything. But how do we buy farm ground in the United States? Well, it's close to home. It looks nice. And it connects up to something else. I got, I got the money, so I'm going to buy it. Right? All I'm saying here is you can do whatever you want to do, but this soil test thing, this is a big Big deal. Is that 7% organic matter ground? That is worth thousands of dollars an acre more. I'm just saying. Now, granted, a lot of times we buy the ground and it doesn't even pay off. We go, well, that didn't make any sense, but I'm going to average it out, right? <laughs> anyway, we do some, some uh, interesting things as farmers. But I want you to think about that just a little bit the next time you go to a land auction. Maybe ask for the soil test, okay? If they even have one. All right. So, we just said organic matter is really important. Here are the top five ways that you can increase soil organic matter. Reducing tillage, you don't have to go no-till, but what they found is that most organic matter increase comes from roots breaking down, roots decaying in the soil. That's what really builds organic matter, not the above-ground residue. The above-ground residue helps protect the soil from erosion, but it's building from below ground and from the roots. So try to leave the roots intact and reduce tillage. Second thing, plant high residue crops with lots of roots. So for example, we raise a lot of corn and soybeans on our farm. Corn has roughly five times the root mass of soybeans. Other things, use manure, compost, use cover crops, use biological products, things like that. So those are the, our top five ways to increase organic matter in the soil. All right, organic matter is really important. Here's the other thing. A lot of people say, well, I'm coming out of a legume crop. It's soybeans or it's some legume, and so I get a nitrogen credit for my corn. Um, no, you don't. There is no such thing. That's made up. There's no guarantee you're going to have any nitrogen left. Now, usually we do. But the reason why I'm bringing this to you is this. Okay, just as an example, on our own farm, okay, in the fall of 2021, there was one field we had on average 34 pounds of nitrogen left over after soybeans. Okay, a lot of people say that's pretty common. I had one field, though, where we had 136 pounds after that legume crop. And by the way, after a corn crop, I have no idea how in the world I ended up with this much nitrogen, but it was a real hot year, our yields were down, and we had that much nitrogen left at the end of the season. The reason why I bring this up to you is this. If you don't test your soil for nitrogen, you don't know how much there is. Now, we can, any of us can guess, but what I'm trying to say is, I had no clue that I was going to have one soybean field that had 136 pounds of carryover nitrogen. That's 
saved me a ton of money going into my corn crop. And I had no idea coming out of corn that we have that much nitrogen left. Okay, and granted, I, I mean, a couple of those fields had some manure in the past, but like these two right here, or this one in particular, that had no, no manure in the past. Um, I didn't put that much nitrogen on that here. I have no idea where that came from other than this. It was a very high organic matter soil and it was a hot year. And I usually only figure we're gonna get 20 pounds out of every 1% organic matter. Who knows, maybe that year we got 35 or 40. It was hot. I don't know. Very high organic matter field. Anyway, please test your soil. Otherwise you don't really know what you're starting with. You don't really know where you're at. And so my point here is, hey, we're, we were shooting the next year for 275 bushel corn. I had a bunch of fields where I, I needed to do nothing in advance. Maybe put some on in season, but hopefully we can manage nitrogen a little bit lower than that by the end of the year. That was a fluke year for us. We've never seen that much nitrogen left at the end of the year. All right, biological nitrogen replacement products. There have been a lot of people talking about this, asking us about it. I'm gonna give you the quick summary and then I'll go through a little bit of data. Here's my quick summary. Every single one of these products work, okay? Every biological nitrogen replacement product that we have tested, they all work. They all create nitrogen. It's just at this point, the cost for that nitrogen is pretty high. Okay, so let me show you our data. We did some more of that this year. Uh, they just got me the results last week, so I didn't include this in, our, in my presentation, but it was similar results. Okay, so in 2022, we had three independent research locations that we worked with. One was out in Michigan, two were right here in Nebraska. Okay, and you'll notice there was one, the one in Michigan, where I literally got no response from anything. And you say, wait a second, you told me all these products worked. They do. But the thing is, what did they create? Did they create phosphorus? No. Did they create potassium? No. Did they create yield just magically? No. They create one thing. What is it? Nitrogen. Well, if you don't need that for your crop, you're not going to get a yield gain. So when we were setting up the trials, so we've got a great research team. So my brother and I uh, have a few guys in our organization that we, we do a lot of research work. And so we had this meeting before we said, okay, we're going to do these trials. And Several of our guys said this to me. They go, well, Brian, we want to leave the nitrogen rate the same, and we're going to put on these biological nitrogen replacement products, and we're going to gain yield. And I go, wait a second. How are you going to gain yield if nitrogen's not a yield-limiting factor? I'm like, huh. Oh, yeah, I haven't thought about that. And I hear this all the time from farmers and even some of these companies. It's like, we're just going to gain yield. No, you're not. Not if nitrogen is not a yield limiting factor. So I said, I don't trust any of these research companies uh, that are gonna do some of this work for us. I said, they don't test the soil in advance. They don't know what they have in the ground. In a lot of cases, we've done trials before. So I said, I wanna put on no nitrogen. And none of the companies are comfortable with that. So if we kind of settled on 60% nitrogen, we said, all right, let's just test it against a 60% nitrogen rate. And as you can see, with Michigan, that still wasn't low enough. They had more carryover in than they thought. Or more organic matter mineralization during the year. I don't know what it was, but all I know is we got no result. So I threw that out, and here's what I did. I just looked at what was my cost per unit of end. You might say, well, how did you figure that? Here's how I figured it. So it takes 1.12 pounds of nitrogen to create a bushel of corn. And you might say, wait a second, I'm, I'm getting by with 0.8 pounds of N per bushel of corn. No, you're not. That's what you're applying. But what I'm saying is you got carryover nitrogen and you've got organic matter mineralization. Okay? You've got to factor those in. I'm saying everything. What was where did all the nitrogen come from? It takes 1.12 pounds, that's what it takes. Okay? Hopefully you can apply a lot less than that. But I'm just saying that's what it takes. So we looked at the yield gain and we divided it by 1.12. That shows us how many pounds of nitrogen we added. And then we looked at, okay, what was our cost here? And what was our cost per unit of nitrogen? Now, that year in 2022, going into the year, uh, nitrogen wasn't cheap. 
Okay, we figured 88 cents a unit for nitrogen that year. It's way cheaper than that now. But anyway, uh, so that's one way to look at it. We looked at cost per unit of N. Here's one other thing that I want you to consider. Proven 40 has done the most advertising in that space. But one of the things that we found out a few years ago, and we've actually been working with them on this now, is you have to make sure you have a good water source. So here's where I'm going with this. Um, number one, chlorine. If you're using a chlorinated water source, let's say it's rural water, municipal water, whatever, what's the purpose of chlorine? It's to kill biologicals. It's to kill microbes. So if you're using a beneficial microbial product, like proven for your any of these, guess what? You put it with chlorinated water, what we found is in a few minutes, maybe an hour, dead. Okay? You wasted your money. So you gotta do something to convert the chlorine or chloride over to chlorine. Or the other way around, I should say, chlorine over to chloride. And chloride doesn't hurt the microbes. Chloride is a beneficial fertilizer product. And you could do that and only cost probably a nickel an acre. So BioPrep is the product we use, but there are others out there too. Uh, the other one is water right, that basically lowers water pH a little bit, but the big thing is it sequesters a lot of the hard water ions, things like calcium, magnesium, iron, and that kind of stuff that can also mess with the biologics. So you can see just from having, hey, we treated the water, we had a much better result, and you can see that, oh my goodness, we gained five bushels just from the water treatment. Okay, that made that product work a lot better. All right, so that's one of the things to think about. Okay, the other thing, I sorted this list a different way. I said, all right, what's the income over the check? And then, hey, the proven 40 turned out the best. Now granted, it costs a lot of money. But here's the thing. So when I go back to this, all right, what did it cost? Well, I can prove it for you, even with the water treatment, it was $1.73 a unit for nitrogen. And some of our research guys, we saw the data, we go through all this stuff, they go, oh my goodness, that's terrible. And we just, let's give up on this. It's just, it looks like the things work, but they're way too expensive. They go, whoa, whoa, guys, you're forgetting two things. I said, number one, you don't run that company. What if next year, all of a sudden, instead of them charging $29.20, they charge $5.20? Would you be interested now? They go, whoa, yeah. They go, well, we don't know what they're gonna charge in the future. I, I know they're ridiculously expensive right now, but maybe they won't be. We gotta test it, that's our job as research. The other thing I said is, how about in areas where they're starting to get limited on commercial nitrogen that they can apply? These things don't count, okay? Just like in Denmark, when we were talking to those farmers there, they said, yep, we could put on this many pounds of commercial fertilizer. We can put on all the biologicals they want, all right? So that may be something that we see much more use of in the future. I just wanted to share with you what our results were. Here's another really important thing to know. When does corn need its nitrogen? This is the chart. Uh, by the way, the source is International Plant Nutrition Institute, but you can look at University of Nebraska Lincoln or many of these universities, they have a very, very similar chart. So here's what I wanted to show you. It takes a long time to use that first 25%. Look at how slow that is right there. Okay? You have to get all the way to about B10 in corn. So it's pretty big corn, and we've only used 25%, but look at this. Usually when we go from B10 to B14, or B9 to B13, whatever it is, that's only 10 days, two weeks, okay? And then we got another, let's call it a couple weeks, and all of a sudden we're hitting tassel. So we've got a narrow window there. Look at how steep that curve is. Uh, we got a narrow window there, and we're using 50% of the total need for that plant. So here's where I'm going with all this. Timing makes a lot of difference. Now for me, on my farm, we're in a fairly dry area, but we're not as dry as you even. Okay, so my dad was originally from Iowa, and he said he married my mom, and uh, basically he left Iowa because he didn't want to be a dairy farmer anymore with his family. He wanted to do crop farming, and so he came to South Dakota, 200 miles away, and he said, Brian, it was like falling off the edge of the earth. 
it was, I, I mean, we were, we had the best soil, we were getting 35 inches of rain a year, and then I come to this, where we're getting, you know, two-thirds the amount of rainfall, soil's not nearly as good, and he said one very important thing that stuck with me all these years, actually he said it to me many times, otherwise it probably wouldn't have stuck, but anyway, here's what he said. He goes, Brian, when I came to South Dakota, I had to be a lot better farmer because what I found out in Iowa is that rain corrected my mistakes. Rain corrected my mistakes. He said, any little problem you have when it's dry land farming in a dry area, oh, it's going to be amplified. You have to be a better farmer. And so one of the things that goes along with that is how are you going to put your nitrogen on? Because you can read all the farm magazines you want, and they're going to talk about, oh, you got to split apply, you got to do all these things. Well, what if it doesn't rain very much? Okay, then you put your nitrogen on the soil. Let's say you put it on about right at this time, and you go, well, oh boy, it looks like about right here, you need lots. So I'm going to put it on about three days in front of that. Oh, that's great to talk about. But what if it doesn't rain until you get to here? You miss that huge window, and there goes 50 bushels on your 40. Okay, so when you're dry land farming, you always want to be a little bit on the early side. And also understand, dry land farming, you don't have near the risk of loss when you're in a, an arid area, and especially if you have heavy ground, high cat exchange capacity. Okay, let's flip it around. Let's say you're irrigating, and let's say it's lighter ground. Honestly, if I was irrigating, and by the way, you might say, well, why aren't you guys irrigating? Uh, the reason why is because they estimate we have 25 miles of solid granite below our ground. You might say, what? No. Yeah. Seriously, that's the estimate, is 25 miles of solid granite below us. So, I don't know, I mean, you could probably drill a well that deep. <laughs> Am I going to go to the center of the earth to get my water? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't work for us, so we're just dry land farmers. But if I was irrigating, I'd be putting some nitrogen on every single pass I made across that field. I really would. And when I'm in control of water, now I can time things up a lot better. I don't have to put so much on early because I've got water, I can push stuff into the ground, I can get it into the plant. So anyway, always look at these timings, think about that timing. Yeah, early on in the year, you don't need all that much. But boy, you get to this peak, that rapid growth stage, you all know when that happens. Usually for us on our farm, it's somewhere around knee high to waist high, and then oh my gosh, that crop just takes off. All right, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about just some soil tests uh, soil test principles, okay? Um, so the first thing I want you to think about is how much will you spend on your farm on fertilizer over the next 30 years? And by the way, we are on page four in your book, or in your handout. How much can I spend? So on our farm, we're spending roughly, let's call it half a million dollars a year. So if I multiply that times 30 years, that's $15 million we're going to spend on fertilizer. And by the way, my yields aren't going down, they're going up. And with inflation, I expect fertilizer costs will probably go up over time. So $15 million is probably, probably light. Okay? It's probably going to be $20 million or more in the next 30 years. Just think about that. Okay? Now, I just want to ask you this question. If you're going to spend millions of dollars on anything, would you say that's something you don't really need to know anything about? Or should you maybe know a little more? I want you to think about what did you learn from your dad and your grandma, your mom, your grandma, whoever helped you get started in farming, uncle, aunt, whatever, cousin, I don't care. When they were teaching you stuff on the farm when you were growing up, what did you spend your time on? Okay, working on the equipment, Operating stuff in the field, probably livestock chores, that was my main job. <laughs> Did you spend any time looking at soil tests? Were you talking about soils? Just think of how things have changed in two generations here in the United States. Two generations ago, most people had livestock, most people had manure, and our yields, well, let's just be honest, compared to today, they were terrible. Okay, we didn't need much fertility. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I realize that, yep, there's a way dad and grandpa did things and a way you may have done things. What I'm trying to tell you is we are going into a new era. Not a lot of farmers have livestock anymore. And even if you do, 
you got to manage that fertility well because our yields are way up here compared to they were way down here before. And this is something that wasn't a big deal for your grandpa. Growing up on the farm, your grandpa spent zero dollars on fertilizer, or almost zero. Okay, they used manure, maybe bought a little bit of commercial fertilizer, but it was not. And today, it's completely changed. So I would just encourage you, think about this a little bit, learn how to read a soil test, learn more about soils and, and soil fertility, and teach your kids and your grandkids this kind of stuff. Because this is what's going to make the biggest difference as we move forward, all right? Okay, just a few quick basics. Just write this down if you don't know this. How many pounds does an acre's worth of soil weigh, roughly, if it's six inches deep? What does it weigh? Anybody know? It weighs about two million pounds. Please write this down. This is super important to know. And I'm dead serious. Teach your kids or grandkids this. You have to know this when you're looking at how you read a soil test. It weighs about two million pounds. So in other words, every three inches of soil weighs roughly a million pounds. Here's why you have to know this. Because if you look at the soil test that was on that very front page, when you look at that, you see a whole bunch of PPM, PPM, PPM. What does PPM stand for? Parts per million. Okay, I'm a farmer. I don't give a rip about parts per million. What do I want to know? Pounds per acre. Seriously. I don't care about parts per million. Talk in my language. Pounds per acre. Why the soil test labs don't do that, I have no idea. If I owned a soil test lab, I will promise you it would be in pounds per acre. So we got to convert stuff over, all right? Now, I know some of you don't like math, all right? But this is a pretty simple one. To convert parts per million to pounds per acre, how many pounds are we representing when we have a six inch deep soil test? What did I just say? How much does that weigh? Two million pounds. And we said this is parts per million. So all you need to do is take the parts per million number times two. Very simple math. So take all these numbers that you just saw in that soil test, right on page one there, and you multiply them by two, that'll tell you roughly how many pounds per acre you've got. Now it's not exact, but it's real close, okay? Let's say you had a 12 inch deep <laughs> soil test. How many pounds would 12 inches of soil weigh? Four million, okay? So all you do is take the parts per million times four. It's literally that simple, okay? Next. Did you know that soil is a great big magnet? Well, it is. What electrical charge does it have, positive or negative? It's got a negative electrical charge. Please write that down or circle it. You've got to know that. It's got a negative electrical charge. And I'll show you why in just one second, okay? Why you have to know that. Before we get to that, I want you to think about this. Let's say you do have livestock, and you're feeding them crop off your farm. If your livestock are short on any nutrients, odds are high that your soil is short on those nutrients as well. It's likely cheaper to just build up your soil, and then that nutrition will get into the animal. Plus, when you do that, in a lot of cases, your yields are probably going to go up. Because I just want you to think about this for a second. When God set up the whole system, <laughs> if you think, well, you know what? It's going to take a completely different set of nutrients over here to raise the crop as what it is to raise the livestock of human beings. Yeah, I don't think so. If you've ever taken any classes in college and you went through animal health or soils or whatever, it's all pretty darn similar. So if you're having issues with your livestock, chances are it goes all the way back to your soils. All right, now let's come back and I want to talk about why does that electrical charge matter? I just told you it's a negative electrical charge. Well. Let me ask you this question. Which nutrients are the, are the most leachable? Okay, which ones are the most leachable? Let's start with that. Where are those the ones that are least leachable? Which nutrients are the most leachable? What's the first one that, that comes to mind right away? Okay, now, a lot of you said nitrogen. Technically, you're not right. Why? Because there are two main forms of nitrogen in the soil. Okay, and yep, now I see a lot of you, oh yeah. Don't just say nitrogen, because ammonium nitrogen has a positive charge, and what does it do to soil? What does a positive do with the negative? They bind. So this is why we want to keep our nitrogen in the ammonium form. We're not worried about losing ammonium nitrogen. We're worried about losing what? Nitrate nitrogen. And why? 
Does nitrate has that in it? It's got a negative electrical charge. Okay? Nitrate has a negative electrical charge. That's the reason why we have issues with it. Because it's literally repelled by your soil. Your soil is literally forcing that nitrate out. Okay? So nitrate is number one on this list of which nutrients are the most leachable. Okay? Number two is sulfate. They say sulfate will leach at about half the rate of nitrate. Okay? Sulfate will leach at about half the rate of nitrate. Boron is a micronutrient. It doesn't leach quite as fast as sulfate, but it will leach also. So I got nitrate, sulfate, boron. The next one would be chloride. Okay? Chloride can leach. And then the other one that I would mention to you is salt. And you might go, wait a second. Salt isn't a nutrient. Well, I just want you thinking about salt. Because we're going to talk a little about salt and sodic soils and things like that. Salts are leachable. If we can turn something into a salt, now we can leach it out of our soil. We can get rid of it. Okay, which nutrients are the least leachable? What's number one? Phosphorus. Yep, phosphorus is number one. Okay, phosphorus is pretty immobile in soil. Even in sandy soil, phosphorus doesn't move very well. Now, there is a limit. So in other words, um, I was talking to a soils expert just a couple of months ago, had him on our radio show, and he said, for him, he's out in California, because I asked him, okay, what do you do with these guys that have orchards? And you want to put phosphorus out there, how in the world are you going to do that? It's not going to go down the ground. He goes, well, well, we put enough on. And I go, well, how much do you have to put on? And he goes, well, I gotta be at at least 250 parts per million of phosphorus. Once I get above that, then phosphorus starts to become a little bit leaching. So think about how hot, how much phosphorus they put on. Crazy. But anyway, phosphorus is pretty immobile in soil. Here's another one, zinc, and then also copper. Phosphorus, zinc, and copper are the three that I think about most that basically don't move in soil. Phosphorus, zinc, and copper. Now, <clears throat> Where we farm, and since it's not irrigated, and since we have pretty heavy soil, we a lot of times will say, yeah, potassium doesn't leach very well either. But if you had sand, and you were putting lots of water on, I mean, potassium can move in soil to some degree. For us, it's pretty immobile. If you had sand and lots of either irrigation or rain, potassium can move somewhat. Uh, so that's maybe a little bit in, on the in-between side. OK, next thing I wanted to show you is this. So back about five years ago, we had this idea where we said, you know what? We're doing a whole bunch of soil testing on our farm. Let's start comparing our soil tests to yield. And here's what I mean by that. So when you soil test, here is how I would encourage you to do it. You want to take your probe, and you always want to go to a GPS point. Now, a little bit later, I'm going to try to talk you into doing smaller grids or zones rather than bigger. But my point is this. However big or small your grid or zone is, you have to pick a GPS point. You go right to that GPS point, and then you sample, let's say, 8 to 12 cores right around that point within a 10-foot radius, 5-foot radius, whatever. Okay. The reason why you want to do that is this. Because now you have a GPS point. With a GPS point, you can match that up to your yield monitor. We've been doing this for the last five years. It's powerful information. And it has helped us change our fertility program on our farm using our own data and figuring out, OK, where are the highest yields coming from? What are we putting on that isn't paying? All right? So I pulled out something from a year ago on nitrate, just because our main topic is nitrate today. And I just wanted to show you this. And granted, this was silage. This wasn't grain corn, but it's the same. On the left side is my level of the nutrient, okay? And I've got a couple more of these that I'll show you uh, a little later. But anyway, this is the level of the nutrient. So 10 parts per million, 20 parts per million, 30 parts per million of malic 3 nitrate nitrogen, okay? On the bottom is my tonnage, okay? Here's my point. Look at what the trend line is showing. What I'm trying to say is this. We don't want to finish the year. If we're going to maximize yield, we don't want to finish the year having no nitrogen left in that soil. 
Okay, the trend line is showing us we probably need to at least leave 30 pounds or 30 parts per million, maybe 40 parts per million. Multiply that out. How many pounds per acre is that? What do we multiply times? Six inch soil this? Two. That's 60 pounds. Maybe 80 pounds. And you're going to get some people that are going to tell you, oh, we got to finish the year with no nitrogen left. Uh, no. You're not going to maximize yield that way. So here's the whole thing, and here's the challenge. When we start talking about regulations, um, I'm great with not having nitrate in the water. I don't want nitrate in the water because, quite frankly, that's lost money to me. Okay? And it makes all of us as farmers look bad. But how are we going to manage that thing when we know that if we don't have nitrate, nitrogen out there, or nitrogen of some sort, we aren't going to maximize yield? Okay? You can ponder that for a minute. We'll come back to that. But I want you to think about this. How much nitrogen do you really need? So let's say you're shooting for 300 bushel corn. It needs 336 pounds of nitrogen. And again, I get it. You're going to tell me, well, I can fertilize with only 250. I'm not talking about what you can fertilize with. I'm talking about how many actual pounds does that crop need. It requires 336 pounds for 300 bushel corn. So 1.12 is the factor. But you have to add in any carryover nitrogen. You have to look at applied nitrogen, all forms. You have to look at organic matter mineralization. You got a lot of those things there. You can subtract off any loss you're going to have or nitrogen pile in high carbon residue or other. And also, I want you to think about how much of your soil's total nitrogen can your plants roots recover? Are they going to get 100% of it? I mean, that'd be great. I don't know if that's realistic. And will you have enough nitrogen every single day for your crop? So there's a lot to ponder there, isn't there? Here's another thing. When you're out looking at your fields in the middle of the summer, a lot of times, guys will see corn leaves like this on the lower leaves of the plant, and they go, oh, my crop's firing. It's suffering from drought. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, nitrogen deficiency. When you're looking at your corn leaves, it's going to be yellowing up the midrib. Okay? So if you see on the lower leaves of the plant, and by the way, just so you know, the, the reason why it's the lower leaves is because nitrogen and potassium, just like phosphorus, they're mobile in the plant. What I mean by that is if the plant starts running short on any of these nutrients, it can rob it from the lower leaves. So it will. Okay? Whereas you have sulfur and micronutrients, they can't rob it from the lower leaves. So if you see yellowing at the top of the plant, you've got a sulfur or a micronutrient issue. If it's yellowing at the bottom of the plant, you've got a potassium or a nitrogen issue. Okay, so anyway. Look at the difference here. Yellowing up the midrib, that's nitrogen. Yellowing around the edges of the leaf, that's potassium. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to think about. If your crop starts to run short on any one nutrient, and this is why you want to balance the nutrients in your soil and have an ample amount there, because if your crop starts to run short on any one nutrient, how do those nutrients get into the plant? They go in with what? With water. And so even if your crop doesn't need water, it's going to start bringing water in because it needs those nutrients. So now you make your crop a water waster. So if you're a dry land farmer and you go, well, I don't know, I can't spend much on my crop here because I don't get much rain, um, I want you to think a little bit differently. Now, keep in mind, most of these nutrients you're going to deal with, especially in dry land, they aren't going to leach away from you. I just told you phosphorus. Copper, zinc, they're going nowhere. And potassium, I mean, as little rain as you get here, dry land, it's not going anywhere. So what I'm saying is if you overdo it or you think, oh my gosh, I overdid it a little bit, that's not going anywhere. Get your soil nutrients up and get them in balance, and then you're going to have a more drought-tolerant crop. All right. Nitrogen stabilizers. You get lots of questions on these, and this is something I'm going to encourage you to do in a lot of cases just to try to prevent nitrogen loss. When are nitrogen stabilizers more likely to pay? When nitrogen rates are high, prices are high in lower CEC soils, when nitrogen is going to sit on top of the ground for more than two days, when it's applied far ahead of when it's used, uh, when soil pH is outside the range of 6 to 7.3, when temperatures are warm in wetter years, and this one is the one we'll focus on today, when you have environmental concerns, when you're worried about it, just spend the money on the nitrogen stabilizer. Okay? The, the whole goal, especially when we start talking about leaching, 
is to prevent that nitrogen from converting over to the nitrate form. We want to keep it in the ammonium form longer. Also, there are a lot of different nitrogen stabilizers out there. Some are going to protect against volatilization. They're cheaper. If that's all you're after, great, use those products. But if you're trying to prevent leaching, well, then a product that only stops volatilization isn't going to help you prevent leaching. Okay? So just make sure you know what you're doing there, and you got to know which form of nitrogen you're applying. So just make sure you talk to your agronomist before you buy a nitrogen stabilizer if it's not the right one. All right. So, a little summary on all the stuff that we've talked about so far, because we've covered nitrate, mostly. We've talked about soils in general, but we've covered a lot of the nitrate. Okay, so how do I reduce nitrogen loss? Please, soil test before any big or any off-season application. But quite frankly, I'm gonna, soil, I'm gonna encourage you to soil test on a regular basis. So like on our farm, we test most acres in the fall, um, and, and not every single year, but you know what? If I was worried about nitrogen, I'd probably be testing every year. Um, but I'll say this, if you at least test some of your ground and you see, ooh, wow, we're getting more nitrogen carried in or carried over from the previous crop, maybe you should test more of your ground once you see that. That should throw up a big red flag, okay? Uh, but also, we test in season. We're usually going to do what we call pre side dress nitrate tests, uh, usually sometime in early June. Okay? We want to see what's there at that point. Because, you know, it's nice to know in the fall, it's nice to know in the early spring, but what do I really have ready for my crop in season? And if I had irrigation, I might even be testing a little bit later than that. Okay? Split apply. Now again, it makes a lot of difference if I'm irrigating or not, if I'm in an area that has a lot of rainfall or not, and if I have heavy soil versus light soil. So like on our farm, we have a lot of ground that's 20, 25 CEC, maybe even 30 CEC, and we got some really heavy subsoil too. Um, we farm in a relatively dry area, so I'm not super worried about nitrogen loss, especially in a dry year. Okay? I always have to be thinking about it, but I'm not as worried. If I had light soil and I had irrigation, I'd be looking at a lot more and I'd certainly be split applying. Apply at timings when the nitrogen is needed by the crop as much as you can. Never exceed 10 times your CEC for applied plus in season or in soil nitrogen. So here's what I mean by that. Okay, so let's go back. We talked about that once, but I want to talk about it again real quick. We said take 10 times your CEC. So if I go all the way back to the beginning and the very first slide and the top number that we have there, okay, on page one, what does it say the cation exchange capacity number is? It says 14.9. Okay, so you take that times 10, that's 149. Now, I'm going to subtract off what nitrogen I have in my test. So if you can see right there, there is nitrate on that same test. It says, looks like I got seven pounds. Okay, so that's not much. Uh, so let's say I had 149 minus seven. The most I would ever do is put on 142 pounds, okay? But let's say you had 40 pounds already sitting in the soil. You can only hold 149, you already got 40 sitting in the soil. What I'm saying is, if it's me, I'm only putting on 109. And so that's where a lot of people go back to, well, I'll just use a nitrogen stabilizer then, and then I can put on all I want. Look, the nitrogen stabilizers are not miracle products. They're going to help you for a while. But if you're putting this on way ahead of the season, it's only going to last so long. So I just encourage you to be thinking about um, what your can exchange capacity number is, <coughs> times 10, minus whatever you have in the soil, I'd probably only apply that, especially if I'm in an area like this, where you've got a lot of problems. All right, then, uh, try to raise the best crop possible to use more nitrogen. I go back to the guy that put on no nitrogen, raised a lousy crop, he didn't suck nitrogen out of the ground. Uh, we've used, okay, so uh, South Dakota State University did, uh, a uh, research project with us. It started probably 10 years ago. And we have tile lines on our farm. We have a lot of them. Uh, and so what they wanted to do is put in this wood chip bio digester thing where basically the purpose was 
our water would flow through these wood chips and it would suck out any nitrogen that was in the water. And it actually did. It did a fantastic job. There was nothing coming out of after that bioreactor that they had. I said biodigester, and bioreactor. Uh, and anyway, that sounds great. It's like, oh, we'll put that in, but are you really going to do that often? And here's the thing. They were monitoring how much nitrogen was going into the bioreactor. We were never over 10 parts per million. And we were raising 250 bushel corn and putting on lots of nitrogen. Okay? What I'm trying to say here is if you raise a great crop, you fertilize it appropriately, there doesn't have to be lots of nitrate going out. All right? Last thing. As long as the soil is not frozen, something needs to be growing on your land to use the nitrogen, and that's where cover crops come in. So this is the last point I've got on nitrate, and then we're going to take a break here in just a couple minutes. But first of all, let me just clarify something. The difference between a cash crop and a cover crop. Okay, a cover crop is literally out there to have something growing on your soil, and in this case, maybe suck some nitrate out. A cash crop is something that you are going to benefit from financially, whether you are bailing it, grazing it, uh, harvesting it, whatever. So either way, I don't care if you're raising a cash crop or cover crop, you want something growing there if you've got a little bit of time left before freeze up in the fall. Now, one of the purposes and what, what I'm going to talk to you about here is so it can suck up that nitrate that's number one, being released from the soil for free, or number two, it may be left from your last crop, because what we were just showing you, you might want to have 50, 60, 70 pounds left from that last crop to maximize yield, okay? We don't want it just sitting there potentially leaching away, that's where having some type of crop can use that up. But you may ask, will that nitrogen used by the cover crop come available again in the future or is it lost forever? Well, it all depends on what you do with it. If you're leaving it out there, it's staying out there, it's going to come back into the system. Now, if you bail it and you take it off, then certainly you have removed some. Okay? Which cover crops use the most nitrogen? Usually I'm talking to guys about the grass crops. A lot of people are raising rye, and I get that that's the most common cover crop in the country. Personally, I like oats, and the reason why I like oats is because it dies off for sure in the winter, and I don't have to kill it as a weed in the spring, because uh, we like to plant when a lot of times there's still a little bit of frost in the ground in the spring. And you might go, what? You're planting when there's some frost in the ground? Yeah. You might call us nuts, but um, worked out great. And then I have something growing right away in the spring. So if you like to wait a month or two in the spring before and, and let the ground thaw out, warm up, everything else, you know what? You might want something that's going to grow all the way until that point. And the purpose is to suck up as much nitrogen as you can. In addition to, this could help you build soil organic matter, reduce erosion, and things like that. So there are a lot of benefits to cover crops. I'll talk to you real quick about the Del Marva region. Uh, I went out there to speak about this, uh, I mean, about a number of different crop production things, uh, but this is one of the big concerns. So Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, out in that area, they have a lot of light soils, and also they have a lot of livestock there, a lot of dairies and stuff like that. So they were running into all kinds of problems with the exact thing that we're talking about today, nitrate loss. And what a lot of those guys decided to do is, hey, we're just raising cover crop on that ground year-round until we raise our cash crop. Okay? They have something growing on the ground all the time. And that is doing a great job of sucking up that nitrate, and they aren't having near the issues that they did a decade ago. <coughs> so I would just encourage you to take a look at all those different practices we've talked about, and certainly consider the whole cover crop thing. All right. We're going to take a break for Scott tells me five minutes. We'll see. Uh, so you can get up, stretch your legs, use the restrooms, uh, go talk to the exhibitors in the back, and we'll get going again in just a few minutes. Thanks.